This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Parents loom large in their children's lives. They take on mythical proportions, even as their offspring age. A father's hands may always be remembered as strong, even after they've withered from arthritis. A mother's words have the power to endure even after death in the memories of her children. Their laughs and their smiles may haunt as much as warm their children into middle age and beyond. If in the end Tom and Carol Lucas devoted themselves to the memories of Belinda and their unborn granddaughter, theirs wasn't a family of Norman Rockwell images and Courier and Ives Christmases. I don't know why we're not closer, Carol would say. The kids just don't come around. Our door is always open, Tom pondered glumly, but we don't see them much. Although it was where their story would take them, the family's beginnings weren't in Texas. Thomas Eaton Lucas was born in Dunbar, West Virginia, and his hoarse, crusty voice, even in the waning years of middle age, would still betray those influences. He met Carol Maxine Morrison, a plain-spoken Midwesterner, in her hometown of Port Huron, Michigan, when Tom was an assistant manager at a dime store, two doors from the dress shop where she worked as the credit manager. There were lots of ten-cent stores in those days, Tom remembers. We had a counter where folks came in for lunch. Carol's boss, the dress store manager, introduced them, and before long Tom noticed Carol lingering outside the store. Sometimes she'd watch me decorate the windows, says Tom, a big, tall, dark-haired man with heavy jowls and a booming voice. I guess it was about a year after we met that we started dating. I like to look at him, admits Carol, a soft-spoken, round woman with deep-set eyes and thick, curly blonde hair. Sometimes I'd smile, and he'd smile back at me. At the time, Tom's parents lived in Cambridge, Ohio. When Tom moved to be closer to them, he convinced Carol to follow. They married on July 22, 1962, and traveled through Ohio, settling in Martin's Ferry, where Tom worked in a steel mill. The children arrived in a pack, first Brian, followed by Barry, and then Brent. Carol was pregnant a fourth time in five years when they learned some startling news about their second son, Barry. The four-year-old followed a ball into the street and never heard the school bus screech to a stop. It almost hit him. Barry hadn't talked much, but we didn't think much of it. Brian talked for him, Carol says. We'd asked the doctor, but he said not to worry. When we had Barry tested, we found out he was deaf. Not much later, on December 30, 1968, a cold winter day, Carol went into labor. Tom loaded her into the family's Volkswagen and bumped along the country roads to get to the hospital. We were expecting another big old baby boy, Tom says with a shrug. After three sons, we'd given up on the idea of a daughter. They rushed into the emergency room, and Carol was ushered in quickly while Tom filled out the paperwork. Ten minutes later, before Carol had time to get out of her dress and into a hospital gown, their first baby girl was born, at eight pounds and one ounce. Through all three boys, Carol had the name Brenda picked out, just in case they had a daughter. Now she held Brenda Therese Lucas in her arms. Carol didn't pay a lot of attention to the fact that the doctor continued to push on her abdomen and that the nurses hadn't left the room. In the days before routine ultrasounds, Carol didn't know another surprise was in the offing. She'd never been told she carried twins. But eight minutes later, a second perfect pink daughter entered the world, a bit smaller than her older sister at six pounds, one ounce. Both infants were healthy. Here's your number two, the doctor said, holding up the baby. I was shocked, Carol said, absolutely shocked. When the doctor came out to talk to the nervous father, he asked Tom, what was it you wanted? Well, Carol wanted a girl, but if it's a boy, it's okay with me, he answered. Well, your wife got her wish, the doctor said, and before Tom could get excited, the physician added, and she got two of them. I got weak in the knees and thought I was going down, Tom says with a laugh. I threw my wide-brimmed hat in the air and I whooped and hollered. Carol had named the other four children, and when she held her final child in her arms, the proud mother came up with yet another bee name. This one, Belinda Tracy Lucas. From the moment his parents brought his twin sisters home, Brian, who was five at the time, would remember being enthralled with them. He held them, especially Belinda, the smallest, helping to soothe the girls when they cried. He couldn't say Belinda and struggled with Tracy, ending up calling the youngest sibling Katie Dudu. When she got older, Belinda would reference her position as the last born in the Lucas family lineup and nickname herself Number Five. With so many youngsters to care for, Carol became a stay-at-home mom. 
She could have worked, but we put the emphasis on taking care of the kids, Tom says. That meant we didn't have as much money as some families.